Well, welcome everybody to the Into the Impossible podcast. And this week I'm joined uh, by, uh, by a very special guest, which is Darren Lapomi, who's a professor of uh, nanoengineering. Is that the, uh, is that the actual title? That's, that's the title. That's the name of the department. Also chemical engineering, but I'm a trained chemist. So we cover a lot of bases. Uh, you, all right. I, I thought it'd be like a whole bunch of Smurf-sized engineers running around there, but uh, but we'll get into what it actually means to be a nano engineer in, in just a bit. I want to read uh, I want to read Darren's uh, Darren's bio here, <clears throat> and uh, let's start if I can find it here. I believe I deleted it. Yep, there it is. So Darren and I actually we met, you know, through a, a strange series of events that uh, seems like a distant memory, but it was really only supposed to take place a few months ago, which is the Kyoto Prize ceremony in San Diego, that uh, was to take place um, uh, takes place annually or has for the last couple of decades, both in Kyoto, Japan, and in San Diego of all places, because I think Kyocera Corporation has their U.S. headquarters here in San Diego. And they've given out awards there for 20 or 30 years in the sciences and the technology uh, branches of technology and engineering and also in the arts. And it's a wonderful organization I've been involved with tangentially for several years. But uh, Darren and I were paired as hosts, sort of uh, uh, caretakers, I don't know, fixers is the right word, Darren, I'm, I'm not sure how to say it, but we were hosting the three uh, laureates this year in, 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 in the sciences. It was uh, Dr. Uh, Professor um, uh, Jim Gunn of the uh, of, uh, Princeton University, and uh, Darren was to host. Um, was it uh, was uh, Chang W. Tong? Chang W. Tong. Yeah. So we'll talk a little bit, perhaps, if we have time. But uh, let me just first introduce Darren. Uh, Darren earned his undergraduate degree in chemistry from Boston University, and his PhD from the Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology at a at Harvard University in June 2010. At Harvard, he worked in the laboratory of Professor George Whitesides in the areas of materials chemistry, nanofabrication, including soft lithography, and nanoskiving, which I don't know. <laughs> nanoskiving has a bit of a, uh, a funny etymology, but we can get into that or not. <laughs> yeah, I, I, do those have any relation to perskivites or? Uh, no, um, but but skiving itself is a British English word that means slacking off. So we came up with the word and then published it before uh, realizing that it was, uh, you know, nano skiving was slacking off in a very uh, small way. Uh, he was also a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University in chemical engineering. He uh, has a very interesting fork in his career, at least or partially in, in one branch of his wave function. He earned a certificate, a so-called mini MBA from Stanford University Graduate School of Business. I think that's uh, quite spectacular. Hopefully we can get into that. It's now called Stanford Ignite. And he joined uh, UCSD in 2012 as a uh, professor in the Department of Nano Engineering, uh, which is part of the Jacobs School of Engineering. And today, in honor, I couldn't find any UCSD shirts to wear in my in my hamper. I didn't want to pull one out, uh, so I, I pulled out a, a Padres jersey uh, in honor of the fact that maybe this will come out soon when the Padres season is set to resume. And as I always say, even in a COVID-shortened season, I like to wear it and support them uh, in the first week of the season before they're mathematically eliminated. <laughs> and uh, so far, that's uh, brought me good luck. Anyway, Darren, long, lengthy introduction to a very impressive. I won't say young man because uh, you're, you're, you're so uh, accomplished. I'll just say it's very impressive to, to have you as a colleague and as a friend and have you as a guest on the Into the Impossible podcast. Today, we're going to talk about your podcast, though. So tell us a little bit more, if you like, about some of the stuff you do outside of your phenomenal uh, uh, teaching and coursework that you put online on your YouTube channel, Darren uh, Lapomi, I believe that's your YouTube handle. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us what else you're up to these days in this era of COVID. So moving into the, the digital presentation space was always something that I was interested in. Um, when I was a little kid, I got a uh, 
it's called a Fisher Price PXL 2000 video camera, which shot about 11 minutes of a black and white video per side of a uh, an audio tape. So very high uh, data rate. Um, that's why you couldn't get very much on there. Um, but you know, we didn't have the money for a, a standalone VHS uh, recorder, so this is what I used. And then you know, various uh, iterations of VHS compact uh, camcorders later. Um, you know, I, I basically just made my stuffed animals act out scenes from Star Wars, and then we we had a a TV show that I produced called Yummy Trek, which was a parody of Star Trek, and um, uh, that that kind of got me through uh, high school. Uh, and then I kind of abandoned the uh, the performance sort of aspect of of nerdiness for a while until uh, I developed all of this uh, this coursework, and I wanted to put it online. And there are a few reasons that I wanted to put it online, one of which is to uh, sort of engage with the active learning or flipped classroom methodology of teaching. Um, and what that allowed me to do was to assign lectures as pre-recorded material and then sort of transform the uh, the class period into a variety hour where we did, uh, where we would do design problems and questions and and uh, and you know, group activities and and modern applications of the material. Um, around the same time, and this was 2017, um, I was asked to organize a uh, discussion series for grad students and postdocs in the engineering school um, on professional development. And I was very excited to take on this role because it got me uh, through it. I was able to make connections with people in industry and and other uh, and and law and um, uh, and other aspects of the business and professional world to bring them in and give talks to the uh, to the students. Uh, however, there were a lot of topics for for which I couldn't find speakers and I ended up giving those talks myself and because I was doing the recording uh, I, I bought all this recording equipment for teaching I ended up recording all of those and I ended up with about <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's a, uh, you know, so many people have asked me for the recording equipment and I just send them my Amazon order order page. But it's, it's you know, a, a not not quite pro model uh, 4K camera. Um, and uh, and so I ended up with about 20 of these lectures and they took an enormous amount of time to prepare uh, the slides and, and what I was going to say and how I was going to respond to questions. Uh, and those so I, I put all of those on YouTube as well and some of those are some of my most uh, you know more popular than the course content um, and I was also getting requests for audio versions um, it kind of made me feel bad at first because I spent all this time making the visuals and the slides but it turns out if you close your eyes it's basically the same you know information uh, that that's on the screen just coming out of my mouth so uh, actually just a few weeks ago I uh, started a podcast Podcast where I was uh, at first just taking the audio versions of some of these talks and putting them on the podcast, and since then I've started to make some uh, some new content and then sort of have a cross uh, cross pollination between the YouTube channel and the podcast. The podcast is called uh, Molecular Podcasting with Darren Lapomi. Yeah, uh, so many things to talk about. First, uh, do you feel like the lectures, the kind of non-scientific, but incredibly vital for the actual successful ship or whatever uh, Homer Simpson would call it, uh, is, is added to your teaching um, abilities? Has it augmented them? Is it a compliment? Is it something that anybody can do or, or, or something unique because you have this passion since by your own admission, since you were a kid, you love to be on camera? I think recording the videos about professional topics has made me has made me consider aspects of uh, of of professional uh, professionalism um, how ideas are generated how to write uh, effectively that maybe in my everyday life as an academic I wouldn't really have a reason to be self-reflective about these things so it really takes a good you know, a couple of days of quite intensive uh, study and, uh, you know, not quite meditation on these these topics to um, 
to develop an appreciation for how to convey them to others and how uh, through the in the process uh, how to how to convey them to yourself and how to um, how to incorporate some of the uh, the 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 tips and tricks into your own uh, work. Um, I think anybody anybody could do it. Um, I think that there are uh, it, it takes a certain amount of of um, comfort with exposure maybe that putting all of your materials and even quite uh quite personal thoughts online for everybody to see uh it takes it takes some of that so i think everyone could do it i don't think everyone is inclined to do it so the the cover artwork is uh was is a molecular dynamics simulation by one of my former students sam root who's now a postdoc at harvard um, he, he, uh, he has credit in my, uh, in, in my podcast description, <laughs> um, the name molecular podcasting came from the, uh, from really two sources. One, I'm a, a chemist and I feel a strong affinity to chemistry and molecules. And, uh, there aren't too many, there aren't compared to your own field and biology, there aren't that many high profile chemists doing outreach work and i'm not going to call myself high profile but i am doing outreach work um and there is there is there is out there is a lot of outreach in the chemical community i don't want to offend anybody uh, but what it, what i what i really mean is there's no equivalent of a uh, of a carl sagan uh not to compare myself to carl sagan i think you know what i'm saying in chemistry i think that it's uh because I, I don't quite know why this is. Peter, uh, Peter Atkins, the physical chemist, you know, tried to do some of this with his book, The Second Law, but it probably honestly never really caught on. Um, so that's one reason. Another is that molecular, um, in terms of, you know, mechanics, we think about continuum mechanics versus molecular mechanics. Uh, molecular mechanics, very small, nano-sized objects um, that... Uh, that are kind of the, the word molecular might be associated with the, the nitty gritty and nuts and bolts of how things actually get done. And I think that's what what differentiates my popularization or my strategy toward popularization compared to maybe some other uh, active scientists. And that I'm really talking about how does the science get done um, kind of on the, uh, the the proverbial molecular scale that a granularity level yeah and actually i was introduced to science my first um inspiration as a popular science author was isaac asimov not his science fiction books uh which i haven't read uh, embarrassingly enough for a person who hosts a podcast called into the impossible based on arthur c Clarke's famous phrases which we'll get into i want to ask you the three questions i ask all my guests uh, towards the very end of our conversation uh, but uh, Isaac Asimov's books on, on science nonfiction, uh, chemistry, atoms, the history of chemistry, I, I couldn't get enough of them. And that was sort of as a 10 or 12 year old. Take us through your world line, as we physicists say. Uh, you obviously, I know your academic pedigree. I'm sorry you went to such, such subpar institutions all the way from undergrad to graduate. Where'd you grow up? What got you into chemistry? What got you into the nano world? And where is your specific research going? And what, what fascinates you about this underworld? Sure, that's, uh, it's sort of the, the parallel track to the schools and, and the degrees. Uh, first, a little side note about, about Isaac Asimov. He was actually a professor at my alma mater, uh, Boston University. Yeah, yeah. And he was a he taught biochemistry at one point when he became a famous writer and he lost his or he gave up or lost or whatever his uh, his permanent position. He actually gave uh, one lecture a year uh, and one of my roommates who had a uh, whose father uh, is a dentist, had him for a, a pre-med dental uh, <laughs> um, uh, biochemistry class. So anyway, um, nice, nice connection there. Uh, and OK, so actually, I'll go back. Isaac Asimov is an example of a trained chemist who is a popularizer. OK. Um, so I grew up in western New York State in a town called Hilton, about uh, 20 miles northwest of Rochester. 
Um, and I got into it's it's hard to pinpoint the the moment I got into science. I can tell you the exact date that I got into like Star Trek because um, I I watched uh, I was watching this um, you know late night TV on the affiliate the Fox affiliate that would run the the reruns. And we just got our 486 uh, family computer in 1993, and I know the date that I started watching Star Trek because Star Trek because my sisters kicked me off of the computer. And when you booted up the computer, and they said that the you know the date that the BIOS was set and everything was was October 10th, 1993. So that's the day that I watched uh, episode 29, uh, Operation uh, Annihilate, where Spock has this uh, this fried egg land on his back that injects some tentacles into his body and then he becomes blind and, and so on so that's the episode that's the particular moment um, Star Trek was hugely influential on me uh, Star Wars before that um, although it doesn't quite have the same intellectual uh, uh, intellectualism in terms of, of myth and exposing a, a young kid to uh, space flight and uh, warp speed and so on and bioneural gel packs and things that I'm thinking about now and haptics and holodecks and stuff Stuff, you know that's uh, th th that's that's there. Um, for a while, I thought I wanted to go into medicine, so I really enjoyed this show on the Learning Channel uh, when we were kind of given an illicit uh, cable subscription um, at, at some point uh, called uh, Trauma Life in the ER, and I really liked the idea of trauma surgery. Um, I liked the intensity of it, or I thought I did. Um, I went to uh, I applied fairly broadly, um, I'm, I'm actually skipping a major part, and that's my interest in music, particularly the piano and the trombone. Um, I, I, I was a, a band geek in high school. Um, I applied to, um, to music school at Eastman and Northwestern for trombone, kind of the, the two of the best brass schools, uh, but I didn't get in, and, um, and no offense to any of my, my, uh, my former music classmates. Uh, I did not want to teach, though. I wanted to be on stage um, in an orchestra or an, or an opera uh, pit, and that's what I wanted to do, but I didn't get into any of the schools that I wanted to for music. Um, however, all of those places, I also applied as a double major to engineering, and I didn't really know what engineering was. My favorite subject in high school was chemistry, so I so I chose chemical engineering. It turns out that chemical engineering has basically nothing to do with uh, with chemistry because it's it's basically all continuum stuff. Um, I, I can just hear people yelling at their at their earbuds uh, right now. Um, but chemist chemical engineering is intellectually much more similar to mechanical engineering than it is to chemistry, um, uh, whereas it's uh, it's fluid mechanics as opposed to solid mechanics. If you take it to sort of a, a you know first approximation. Uh, but so uh, the the other, if, if a school didn't have a chemical engineering program, I applied to biomedical engineering or bioengineering and for no other reason that it, it, but that it sounded cool and it had like the most syllables. So uh, at Boston University, I was a bio, biomedical engineering major for uh, uh, a couple of weeks. Um, but my second year of undergrad, 9-11 uh, happened and it made me... Uh, um, very, uh, I don't know, skeptical or, or uninterested or, or actually disinterested for a time in technology and the way, uh, and, and becoming part of, of some, you know, technological uh, machine. Uh, and so I just wanted because, to, sorry to interrupt, but you mean because uh, it might have some potential, application towards defense or warfare is that what you mean because uh it, this, it it felt let, let me let, let me rephrase i think it's because it it felt too dry and mm. and uh and non um not human facing right not uh, nourishing of the yeah human not, okay I get exactly it. yeah so um I switched my major to anthropology, and uh, <laughs> that's pretty radical. Wow. I switched from physics to mechanical engineering to astronomy to physics. So, <laughs> so we, we we'll get we'll get narrow, but at first, you know, it's like the Fourier transform. We gotta we gotta narrow it down here. So uh, so we we went to to I, I switched to biological anthropology because I was very interested in in uh, in behavioral biology and evolution and and things like that. Um, my uh, I had a, a fantastic um, 
uh, I read a fantastic book in my introduction to biological anthropology course called uh, Lucy's Legacy by the primatologist Alice, Alison Jolly. Uh, and in this book, um, the author has since passed away, but she, uh, she referenced an author named E.O. Wilson several times. And E.O. Wilson, uh, Edward O. Wilson, a famous uh, professor at, uh, at Harvard and, and, and curator of the, the American um, or the, the Harvard uh, Museum of Natural History wrote the book Sociobiology, which was, uh, along with a couple of other books in the early 70s, including The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins, sort of introduced the idea of this, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's not introduced, but popularized this idea of the deep connection between uh, molecular evolution and, uh, and biological adaptation and then uh, um, social behavior in, in animals. And the last chapter in sociobiology was where he uh, he daringly uh, applied the uh, the the concepts of sociobiology to human behavior, and that was hugely controversial. And there was this uh, this period of, of time where he was uh, kind of ostracized by the uh, by uh, by the academic um, uh, left, uh, famously um, uh, other people at Harvard like uh, Richard Lewontin and Stephen uh, Jay Gould. Uh, and so anyway, he, he, he became, he, he wrote a follow-up book called On Human Nature, where he sort of doubled down. Um, and then later on in his, in his writing career, um, he became, uh, he, he wrote a book uh, called Consilience, which is about the, the unity of knowledge. And um, the, central theme of the book is the is the deep connectivity between all branches of learning so really the only reason that uh, that chemistry and physics and biology are, are considered even different disciplines is because of historical accidents you know where does where does uh, chem physical chemistry end and chemical physics begin uh, it's just a it's probably a uh, a, a fuzzy boundary at best. Maybe it's even a, a counterproductive boundary. And if you look all the way up through levels of organization in science and human learning, you go from biology to neuroscience to uh, to psychology to economics or sociology, um, and and at, at which point do the boundaries actually make sense? Um, and one could argue that because it's all historical accidents, I mean, the reason that chemical engineering departments exist is because uh, is because we're trying to process chemicals on a large scale, largely due to the uh, needs of the petroleum industry. Um, but, you know, there are it's, it's very rare to find research in a chemical engineering department that could not happen be happening in in a physics department or a chemistry department or even a uh, even in some cases a biology department so there's so much intermixing um, that uh, once i was in uh, once i was an undergraduate um, i wanted to find a way to combine these interests um, and i've taken quite a garden path here thank you for your <laughs> for your patience um, so i was so this was uh, biological anthropology, uh, that was my major, um, but I had an excellent teacher in, uh, in chemistry uh, 102, uh, John Straub, who's a, uh, a physical chemist, sort of a, a protein dynamicist. And he, uh, he really, he took a lot of time one summer when I was uh, cleaning toilets for the Office of Conference Services at, at BU, and I, I listened to my, my CD Walkman, and then on my lunch breaks, I would read these books by Gould and Wilson and Alice and Jolly and, and whoever I, I get my hands on. Uh, and, uh, and he and I started to, de to develop this idea of an independent concentration where I could take whatever I wanted and then do some sort of senior thesis at the end. Uh, what I eventually ended up doing though was taking a, a little bit more of a, of a conventional route. Um, I changed my major uh, to biochemistry and then to uh, straight up chemistry and then added a minor in physics and then said, okay, we're, we're, we're not going to spend a lot of intellectual resources on this independent concentration. I'm just going to do that stuff on the side and get a traditional uh, degree. So around that time, I got a, uh, a fellowship from the Beckman Scholars um, 
uh, program, which provided summer funding for two consecutive summers in one academic year. And I got to pick any uh, any professor's lab. So I chose uh, Jim Panic, who was doing natural product total synthesis. So this is where a, uh, a molecule is isolated, in this case, from a bacterium that lives in a sea sponge off the coast of Papua New Guinea that had uh, biological activity against uh, against uh, very uh, dangerous uh, fungal infections that occur in HIV AIDS patients as well as uh, as, as patients on chemotherapy. Uh, and so there wasn't a route to a lot of this material. They only recovered, you know, less than a milligram from the uh, from the sponge. So there's a lot of value in in making in developing a synthetic route to come up with uh, with more of this material. So uh, with my graduate student mentor, Neil Langell uh, and I, we, we made the, the compounds. Um, I think I can do the rest in like in like less than a minute. So then <laughs> then I went to uh, I went to grad school uh, to originally to continue my interest in in organic chemistry, uh, but I found that I was kind of burned out on the topic quite honestly and I ended up joining George Whiteside's group because at the time he had a project on uh, the uh, the chemical origins of life, so how do you get uh, how do you get energy dissipating self-replicating systems in uh, in abiotic conditions? Um, that project didn't really go anywhere. Uh, Instead, there was this other project uh, based on unconventional nanofabrication of, uh, of uh, various structures. Really, it has everything to do with the, the, the postdocs who were hired at the same time as I came on and a grad student, um, Emily Weiss, uh, Ryan Checky, and Michael Dickey, who took me under their wing, and I learned really their craft from them. Uh, then when I did a postdoc at Stanford, um, it was... Uh, to to combine my interests in organic chemistry with material science, uh, and that's uh, where I started to work on stretchable bio-inspired electronics and devices. Then when I started at UCSD, the idea was to combine literally all of my interests in uh, building molecules from the ground up for applications in devices that interface with, uh, with biological systems. Mm. That was quite a peregrination. <laughs> but, uh, my, very, my apologies. <laughs> but very, uh, but very intriguing. Uh, at, at the, it's, it's too bad you and I both are, you know, New Yorkers, and so we speak pretty quickly. So even even at two x <laughs> multiplier on the YouTube or on the uh, uh, on the iPod, you will uh, still still be able to cut it down. But uh, well, uh, astute users will will find the half speed as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I like to uh, alternate between uh, half and, and double speed just to keep my brain active. Uh, you mentioned a lot. It's clear to me we're going to have to have another conversation uh, about uh, about specifics. Maybe we'll have a, a separate conversation about um, these academic issues. I'll just say one thing that it's clear, you know, as Saron Kierkegaard said, you know, life must be lived uh, forwards, but it can only be understood looking backwards. And now I do have an understanding of why you are, you know, sort of uniquely able to fuse the very hard technical, um, very scientific aspects of, of cutting edge research and pedagogy as you do in your academic playlist, so to speak, with this kind of, I always forget, is it your left brain, right brain, I forget, the other side of the brain, which deals with the so-called soft or interpersonal uh, attributes of the of the human intellect and and that simultaneously through you they can both find a, a safe a safe purchase and and that is uh, a, a testimony to the work that you presumably put in in your one of your many undergraduate majors and 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 your curiosity you know I, I picked up a lot of things there that that you've uh, you're an avid reader uh, I think that you're uh, extremely curious intellectually and that your curiosity isn't just restricted. And I don't mean this pejoratively, but we both know people that only focus on what they do and they're, they could be tops in the field of what they do. But, but in terms of a more broader panorama of the big picture of science, uh, the, the background that you've uh, outlined seems to very naturally suit you to be in a position to communicate these vital lessons to our students. And some of those lessons are really never taught. One of your lectures, um, I think uh, I think it's a good title. Maybe you should use it for your book, but it's called uh, How to Win F Friends and Influence People. Already the, uh, the title of a very popular book. <laughs> oh, too bad, so sad, yeah. Uh, but, the, uh, but, the, but that 
in that lecture, you give an overview of how, uh, of how people perceive the role and the place of a scientist and the way that, uh, or an engineer and how he or she should orchestrate their balance between technical ability and interpersonal abilities. And those can include networking, public speaking, um, you know, listening skills, communication skills, uh, and versus the pure technical skills, which seem a lot easier and seem a lot more important. But most scientists and engineers believe that that is the number one thing is to be technically competent. In reality, it's as you present in your in a wonderful pie chart, I believe, is is the exact you know complement of that structure. In other words, it's basically two thirds or maybe three to one. Uh, you know, ratio between between the interpersonal skills and network uh, networking, et cetera, to technical skills. Now, why? What do you make of that? I, I have a I have a certain theory about that, but I want to segue into academia right now uh, uh, by asking you that. Why do you think that a the perception is exactly inverted, and b why do you think it is that to be a successful engineer it really benefits you to work on things outside of chemical engineering? I mean, if you had to put a bet, uh, it would be uh, it would sort of place most of your tokens on the soft skills, so to speak. It's it's very interesting. The there's an idea I think perpetuated by uh, caricatures like Sheldon from uh, from The Big Bang Theory or Martin Prince from The Simpsons that these uh, these uber intellectuals, you know, are are the scientists and are the scientific leaders. Um, I would uh, I would say that the the scientific leader. Uh, is not necessarily always, uh, in fact, in my experience, rarely the, the smartest person in the room on kind of a raw intellectual horsepower, uh, however you want to you want to say that. Um, you know, I have I have students who who can do so much more than I can, uh, you know, with a with a, a theory or, or, or building a building a computational algorithm to calculate some some property. The I think the it's important to have a, a a meta appreciation for one's own skills and what one brings to the table. Uh, there was a there was a an interview with the chef Alton Brown on a show, the the Big Idea with Donnie Deutsch, that appeared I think sometime in the late two thousands when that show was still was still a thing. I don't I don't know if it is. Uh, and Alton Brown said, you know, ultimately you're you're selling yourself as a as a product. And the analogy that I use is to find the sharpest arrow in one's quiver and to use that over and over again, because life is short and uh, and we're not going to solve uh, every problem. We're not going to learn every skill. Uh, but what we can do is kind of, you know, train our phaser fire on the weakest part in the Borg cube and uh, and and make some make some headway there. In my case, uh, I would say that. Uh, that having a good broad liter literacy of science and technology along with an appreciation for uh, for how one must work with others and how working with others generates ideas um, is is the is sort of my my sharpest arrow um, I think the the ability to communicate with uh, with individuals in the group, um, uh, not not just what is their next next experiment going to be, but how are they going to manage their time to get through a period in their life where they, uh, you know, they're not making a lot of money. Uh, they live in a in a too hot apartment that literally where air conditioning is literally banned. <laughs> um, you know, they uh, they may be very insecure. This is probably the, the most asymmetric power dynamic they're ever likely to experience. You know, grad, the grad student PI relationship. Um, I try to uh, to be. Uh, to be as empathetic and gentle as I can with that uh, with that relationship, because I know how uh, how tenuous uh, it is from the standpoint of the student. So I I would say that um, I would say that be, being able to identify one's uh, one's one's skills outside of the technical realm are you know in in 
indeed the the uh, sort of the the inverse or, or complement of of what one would normally consider from the outside to be important in an in an engineering or or basic science lab. Yeah, I often feel like scientists in my field or in, in many other fields um, almost uh, exemplify kind of this inverse of the you know Peter principle of you know you basically rise to the level of your incompetence. I think where scientists do. Uh, is that they're assumed to be so brilliant and engineers too, just the raw intellectual horsepower, as, as we say, uh, that they can do anything. And that includes being a leader, being a PI, being a professor. I mean, I, I never received any training in being a professor. In fact, some of the best education I had uh, was with uh, when I was preparing to become a certified flight instructor. And there you learn about the actual needs of the student, not just what how brilliant you know the instructor needs to be, uh, but also the needs of Maslow's hierarchy. I know that's you know somewhat uh, outdated nowadays, but there there are you know versions of it. But I note that I was never taught that. I was never taught you know here's how you become a professor. It was assumed that because I'm so brilliant allegedly, uh, that I'll be good at teaching. But really the skills are could not be more different. And sometimes the most uh, educated, most intelligent are sometimes they make the worst teachers. Yeah. And, and, yeah. Go ahead. It, it's actually the last uh, the last sort of valley of death in the academic progression where one stage looks nothing like the stage before it. And the first one occurs between high school and undergrad. And the first thing that I noticed is that once you start in, in college, you know, people, your, your TAs and your instructors are you know, they're not viewing you as a number, but they're kind of viewing you as a number and a, and a, and a, and a position on the on the bell curve, uh, you know, for, you know, exam scores or whatever. The uh, the next level up between undergraduate and graduate education, the the, the modalities of training look nothing alike. And uh, I think some degree of merging the way we teach undergraduates with the way we teach graduate students would probably end up benefiting both education at the bachelor's and PhD uh, level. Uh, and then, you know, where it's completely coursework based and then it's completely experiential in graduate school. Uh, and, and yet, you know, you're still paying tuition or your advisor is paying <laughs> your your tuition or whatever whatever we call tuition uh to make it not tuition uh, because it's illegal um <laughs> right exactly uh, and then the last transition between either phd or postdoc and then becoming you know a, a lab director and that's not necessarily just in academia but that could be any number of industrial positions as well you know there's no there's no similarity whatsoever beyond you know the the two hours per day that you actually get to apply to actual research or to think about formulation of hypotheses. Hub market. I mean, where else? I would say, like, imagine if it was like incredibly easy to play triple A baseball again. You know, my, my Padres jersey. Imagine like anybody could do it. I could do it. I can't even you know uh, t throw a pitch more than twenty miles an hour probably. But let's just say Brian Keating could be you know starting pitcher on like. Uh, what's the name of our uh, local AAA team? Anyway, there's a team up in um, in Temecula. Uh, it's like the Padres farm team. But imagine if it was super easy for me to get that job. Uh, and then imagine if it was basically impossible to become a major league baseball player. Like you go from being, you know, basically a buyer's market where it's very easy for me to get a job as a, uh, uh, you know, as a as a pitcher or whatever in AAA. And the very next level on the academic rung is basic, almost forbidden nowadays. I mean, I just had a postdoc uh, get a get a very prestigious professorship offer from a top school in the UC system. I'm not going to name him because he hasn't announced it officially. And I don't want to uh, oh, congratulations. tramp that's, that's uh, his, or her, his or her chances <laughs> at actually negotiating for the highest possible startup. Uh, but uh, but it's it's quite, it's quite, and it was like, it made my day. I mean, it, when I heard that, I was like, I knew that there were 400 other applicants to this job. And in no other place is, you know, I call it the academic hunger games. Like you compete at all these different levels or all these gatekeepers and, and the rules of the game change at every level. And it's so hard to keep in, uh, to keep things straight as to, you know, by what rules, uh, what organizing principles, symmetry principles, shall I devote my energies as an undergraduate versus a graduate student? Cause you're right. If it looks very different, the modalities of pedagogy are different. 
I thought graduate school would just be a harder version of undergrad. You know, the homework problems would be hard. I knew that, you know, as an undergrad, there were problems I couldn't answer because I just wasn't as smart as my other, you know, classmates. But I knew that they could get it and somebody could get it. But graduate school, you don't even know the question, let alone the answer most of the time. And that level of uncertainty drives the human mind <clears throat> kind of a little bit uh, to distraction and, and may cause actual harm, I think, emotionally, that uh, academics suffer from higher rates of depression and, uh, and even suicide. I, I speak about that a little bit in my book, Losing the Nobel Prize. One of my mentors as a postdoc committed suicide. And he was, you know, top notch of his field at Caltech, always perennially shortlisted to win a Nobel Prize in physics for great discoveries that he made. Yeah. And, and yet, there, and no one will ever know why he, why he did such a thing, but, um, uh, but uh, and actually, ironically, his wife or ex-wife, uh, Frances Arnold, won the Nobel Prize in chemistry just a few years ago. And I'm wondering, like, do you see this, uh, that your mission in part, at least, is to benefit the mental health of our very cherished students? Absolutely. And I frequently get emails uh, from students thanking me for the material that I post. Um, I have one particular talk on the, the word unconventional is in scare quotes, uh, unconventional careers for PhDs, and they're called unconventional by, you know, people like us because a career outside of academia for a PhD is considered unconventional, even though that's 95% of PhD holders. Uh, and the system is the system is is the the, the way that this the reason this pyramid scheme kind of exists is because of the funding structure. We don't call the thirty billion dollar NIH budget as an educational, you know, as an, as primarily consisting of educational grants, but really that's what it is. The vast majority of the thirty billion from NIH or the seven seven and a half or whatever it is billion from NSF, most of that is going toward uh, toward training of graduate students, and we call them research grants, but really it's you know they're they're educational grants. Uh, and we don't do a great job at preparing uh, PhDs for the, uh, the positions that, uh, that, that are actually open to them, at least, you know, by the arithmetic. There are just so many fantastic PhD researchers who are not going to be employed as tenure track professors. Uh, and what we need to do is, is bring in people from, uh, from industry and consulting uh, and a policy and government and show them the, you know, if we're going to keep the funding structure the way, the way it is, we have to find a way to, to open the doors to positions outside of academia and perhaps outside of 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 stem focused industry uh, as well because these are very important jobs uh, being done by extremely smart hardworking impactful individuals and the exposure uh, to those worlds is is not not good at a university. Uh, my uh, my wife is a good example. She has the same academic pedigree that I do. Um, she did her. Uh, she worked for a number of startups after finishing her uh, her postdoc at Stanford. Um, she did her her MBA at the Rady School of Management at UCSD, um, and is now working in biotech. And I would say uh, making a real difference on the uh, on the COVID response. Actually works um, in. Uh, it, uh, for one of the companies that has one of the uh, the largest uh, market shares of COVID testing um, in the U.S., so this is this is a way that somebody who um, you know who's who's working in the in, on the business side of a technology or of a biotechnology company is making a much bigger impact, frankly, than I ever will in my you know just in the last three months. The impact has been bigger, um, but. Who, who even knows, you know, what upstream marketing is? We don't teach that to, to we don't teach, we think it's, you know, advertising, upstream marketing must be, yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah. Or like upscale marketing, oh, so it's like a Super Bowl ad. No, it's, it's nothing like that. Yeah, I had a conversation with uh, the patron of the Simons Observatory, Jim Simons, uh, who's had success in three widely disparate fields from pure mathematics to, uh, to uh, running a, the world's uh, one of the world's largest hedge funds, to running uh, the one of the world's largest philanthropic organizations dedicated to pure, not applied research, 
And he said, you know, one of the most important attributes of a good scientist is to be a salesman. Not in the you know sleazy cloying you know kind of way at the at the well I won't say used car salesman because some of them are friends <laughs> of mine but but you get the idea the stereotype is is certainly has some uh, wide applicability but but it is a skill that is incredibly underappreciated and uh, and and actually. Uh, this is a part of my philosophy uh, in the way I run my group uh, with uh, my colleague, Professor Cam Arnold, is we mandate that our students spend a certain amount of time outside their own discipline, learning about other branches, not, not of you know, engineering necessarily, although that's very important, uh, obviously, for what we do on a practical basis, but, but actually to understand you know, controversies in other branches of astronomy that are totally unrelated uh, to the cosmology, to the origin of the universe that we do for our day-to-day activities and even within cosmology to explore alternatives not wacky things but to explore like uh the 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 10 reasons you should not believe in the big bang just for example because i think it sharpens the mind to really be able to you know as we say you know you should know what to say to a heretic in in whatever religion or cult you're a member of and and, and in this case uh there's there's reasons to uh, that benefit the mind by going against the grain of the traditional orthodoxy and i think that's emblematic exactly as you said we call it unconventional but really, those are the dominant, uh, you know, kind of attributes and skill sets. And we just don't teach them because we're interested in making these, you know, mushroom spore clones of ourselves. And because I think to give ourselves some leeway, we, uh, we don't get taught it ourselves. And, you know, we're, there's, there's um, you know, there's an old saying in, in psychiatry uh, that I learned from, you know, Dr. Judson Brewer. And that's, you know, victims, victimize victims, or you know, <laughs> basically we are the byproduct of the system. So it's going to take people like yourself to kind of break the mold that, look, these are, these are equally, maybe even more important. And just to say that is so shocking. The problem, of course, is that our elder colleagues might not, you know, who are the gatekeepers of our advancement. And we should point out advancement doesn't stop when you're, you know, merely, uh, you know, when you become a professor, right? In some ways it begins and it begins anew the academic hunger games. We're running a little bit lo uh, long on time. I want to respect your, your, your schedule. I do want to just um, uh, touch base on, on one thing that I'm just very curious about you, and then we'll schedule for the next episode if you'll uh, come back on the podcast, or maybe uh, we'll, we'll time it uh, for a couple of weeks from now. I want to talk about your article in Cell about coping and dealing with um, remote education using uh, uh, during COVID and your tools and tactics, because it looks like we're going to be in for a long ride with COVID, unfortunately. And then I wanna ask you some of the questions I ask of all my guests. These are kind of big picture, looking deep into the future, billions of years, and then looking deep into the past, advice to your former self. So we'll leave that as a teaser for everybody for part two. Darren, will you come back on a part two? I'd love to. So let me just conclude with a question that I'm just very curious about. Um, if you had to teach, you know, you had a billboard or whatever, and, and you could teach the most important thing in your field in, in either chemistry, chemical engineering, uh, nanoengineering, uh, what would that thing be? What, what is the most fundamental result of nanoengineering? I remember reading about this, a book, Nanocosm. Uh, what the heck is the guy's name? Um, you know what I'm talking about, right? This is the first popularization of nanotechnology. I am thinking of... Uh... Prey by Michael Crichton, thinking of Engines of Creation uh, by K. Eric Drexler. Drexler. Drexler yep. wrote Nan Nanocosm, too. Yep, that's right. So these are 20, 30 year old works, right? Um, uh, what is the most important thing that you wish every human being that you meet, you just want to shake them? What's the most important thing in nanoengineering? <laughs> Uh, I have an answer. It's a bit more of an ensemble answer than a nanoscopic answer, but it's something that really struck me recently, and that's the importance of energy dissipation in on the, the very small scale. So people think that the reason that tape sticks to walls is because you have very you know intimate van der Waals adhesion between the the glue molecules, which is really just a low glass transition temperature polymer, you know attached to the porous surface. But really, what you're doing is you are you're routing the goal of of engineering a, an adhesive is to route as many uh, as much of the mechanical work as possible into molecular bond deformation so that it goes there instead of separating the interface with the, with the material uh okay so that's a, a bit of a boring thing but dissipation <laughs> so so dissipation is 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 not always like a bad thing like uh like friction friction 
if if there were no if there was no energy dissipation in the earth and the 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 interaction between the soles of your shoes and the and the earth you would just take one step and then circle the globe right so so dissipation in engineering is one of the most important important aspects of engineering science that we don't teach explicitly. You know, we teach conservation of energy and the first law of thermodynamics, but we don't say, look, this is really important. It has really bad and really fantastic uh, uh, applications or, or consequences. So, you know, know where all of your energy is going and, and engineer for your energy to go where you want it to go. Fantastic. Yes. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll tell that to my kids when you're not letting enough dissipation to take place at the molecular <laughs> level, Sonny. Uh, well, Darren, uh, this has uh, been so much fun. We, we might need like to have our own series, you know, multiple <laughs> lectures. Um, I want to point people just while we have the time now to your podcast, molecular podcasting. <clears throat> also your YouTube channel, Darren Lapomi. Uh, that's Darren with two R's. Uh, E-N and then L-I-P-O-M-I -I for those of you listening. Uh, it's really worth your time. Even if you're not a scientist, uh, you can replace succeeding in scientific research in this playlist with anything that you do. It could be business, management, uh, anything where there's a responsibility, a duty to communicate complex ideas in a quantitative realm uh, that will benefit you. So I think I'm, I'm in, in, encouraging my listeners, my audience to go out there and do that. Look into Darren's research. He does such fascinating stuff. Uh, it's too bad we didn't get to do the Kyoto prize, uh, ceremony stuff together this year, but hopefully it'll be back on at some point in the future. And as I said, I will really want to go over this wonderful, uh, piece that you put in, uh, in the journal cell, uh, not too long ago when I thought COVID would be a passing fancy. <laughs> and now, yeah. now so it it's like, a trends in chemistry published by cell, but just, just to cell. give them their okay. due. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so I'll have a link to that in the notes in the YouTube video. And, uh, Darren, this has been such a pleasure. I hope you have a rest, uh, a restful uh, rest of your week. And I hope, uh, we can catch up again, maybe sometime in a couple of weeks. I hope so too. And, uh, we'll certainly make it happen. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Darren.